American, I'm from the National Intelligence Council in the United States. Uh, I, this is the agenda I originally came up with. I'm going to adapt it a bit, if that's okay. Talking to some people this morning, I realized that a lot of people don't know what the U.S. National Intelligence Council is. So let me briefly discuss that. I did discuss a little bit about how and why we look at the future, and then I'll get into the Global Trends Project, which is something that's been going on for actually a couple of decades now. But we'll look at it both and how we did it then and how we're looking at it in the future. But it brings these people together with people who are scholars and academics, uh, people from different universities, people from the military, people from business, brings them all together. Because if we're really going to look at the world and how it's evolving over time, it's important to bring all these different paradigms that these people bring into the room. And so that's what we seek to do on the U.S. National Intelligence Council. Uh, we, when we imagine the future, uh, it, it, is, it is not an easy task. There's a book that came out last year by a guy named Dan Gardner uh, called Future Babel. And he looked back at all the futurists, let's say for the last half century, to try to pre uh, figure out how reliable their predictions were. And let me tell you, they didn't do a very good job. Overwhelmingly, the predictions these people made were wrong. And, and what's most striking, the people who were most confident that their predictions would turn out, turned out to be the most wrong. Uh, if we go another 30 years hence, how many people really foresaw the challenges coming in, in, in the nuclear South Asia, or the collapse of the Soviet Union, or democracy emerging in, in Eastern Europe? And if we look just in, as recently as 1992, I fathom not many people really saw the emergence and the impact of Chinese capitalism, the, the dangers of cyber warfare, the emergence of democracy in North Africa, or the emergence of a $16 billion website called Facebook. The world is changing dramatically. Why do we make these mistakes? Well, we tend to see it in the paradigms that we are at that moment in time. For example, if we were standing here, and it was right after World War II, one paradigm we may have is that the world would be superpower dominated by two superpowers. There would be strong functional institutions like the, uh, like the IMF and the World Bank. That there were clear rules of the world with how we could play, and the U.S. would be uh, uh, perhaps a great stabilizer. But the world's changed a lot since then. It didn't work out quite that way. And a lot of new forces came to the fore. And now if you ask people what was, what, how they saw the world evolving, it would be somewhat different. It might be something like uh, changing power relationships, not just two superpowers out there, but it's actually changing. That there's actually a governance deficit around the world, where governments aren't performing to, to the satisfaction of the people. That the rules of the road are no longer so clear as we once thought they were. And that the U.S., which was once thought as kind of a stable stabilizer, is now seen as a variable, and people don't really know uh, what role it will play. These are the challenges we faced a long time at, at the National Intelligence Council. And so about 20 years ago, we started something called the Global Trends Project. What this culminates in is every four years, uh, we produce a major study for the President of the United States. Uh, it is presented to the President between Election Day and Inauguration Day. The reason for this is day-to-day -day campaigning is done. Day-to-day -day governing for a new president hasn't begun, or if it's an existing president, they have a bit of a break. It's time for them to think strategically about the world. The report that's presented to him may be produced by us, but it's not really an American report. It's the result of meetings and consultations all over the world. Some of you may have participated four years ago when I came here, and we had a workshop here for a couple of days in Indonesia to try to get Indonesian views about how you saw your country evolving, how you saw the region evolving, how you saw the world evolving. And then these then were folded in to the Global Trends 2025 report. Now we're working on the 2030 report. There's been meetings all over the world on this with different scholars, academics, uh, government officials, military officials. I just got back from a meeting in Moscow. We had another group go to, go to Africa. Uh, group, another group has been traveling around Asia, Latin America, all to get these sentiments to work into a report that really reflects not just the American view, but more of a world view. And this is presented to the president, and one week later, it's on the internet. You can look at it, you can look at the past one on there, the next one will be on there one week later. The first one's demography. Demographers are actually pretty good at, at figuring out where populations are likely to increase, 
decrease or stay the same. They're also pretty good at figuring out where populations are like to, likely to move. As we see here, the two examples of Shenzhen uh, and how uh, two views basically of the same area and how rapidly that area has grown. Uh, we predict that over the next 20 years, 300 million people will move from the countryside to the cities around the world. This is going to have a major impact. The second one, the resource issue. The increasing demand of resources, both, both, both by population growth and by increasing numbers of people into the middle class, is likely to place stress on any of a number of resources. This chart here, for example, the red areas, show areas that are likely to come under increasing or significantly increasing water stress in the coming years. The third area which we're concerned is the diffusion of power. The old days in which there were two superpowers are gone. It's, it's emergence of a new uh, kind of dynamic. These are just two charts that two different groups came up with, uh, somewhat similar, showing how they see power evolving over time. Uh, let me just say, it, it shows power in terms of like GDP, military spending, population growth. It doesn't say how the countries are likely to use their power. And the final kind of certainty is kind of an, an interesting one, it's a new one. It's called, it's individual empowerment. In which the states might not be as powerful as they are in the future, and individuals are likely to exert even increasing power. One dynamic of this is the growth in the, in the middle class. If you look at that chart, it doesn't say that the middle class in the United States and the West is in, in decreasing in absolute numbers. What it shows is there's going to be a massive increase of the middle class in different parts of the world, particularly in Asia. And the middle class, as you know, has new demands on society. And, the new, and so this is likely to lead to more empowerment uh, of those populations. We then take these things, these, these megatrends, and we mix them up with what we call the game changers, which is just a fancy word for the things we're less certain of. And in this part, you'll notice my, my conversation and the way I speak will change a bit because these are the areas we really don't know how they're going to evolve. It would be nice if I could tell you, but we just don't know. And let me just point out five for you. The global economy. Question, will the United States and the West manage to resolve their economic problems and become resilient again? I can't give you an answer to that. We don't know. Will China continue on its path? Or will it inevitably hit that aging hurdle that it will have to face and hit a bump and not make it? Will India continue on its strong economic path, or will the urban rural divide eventually cut back on that? How, how will Indonesia, how will many other countries do? I, you know, it'd be nice if we could say, but we really don't know. Next one, governance. Will, gover will governments be able to adapt to the changing uh, political and cultural environment around the world? In other words, will what we've seen happen in the Middle East and North Africa, will that just be isolated to that area? Or is this really a precursor of what we're likely to see in many other areas of the world? The potential for conflict. Studies show that over time since World War II, the number of interstate conflicts have actually declined. We're not so sure this is going to continue on this path. The, the, for example, the increasing demand for resources is creating pressures that may lead inadvertently to conflicts. Uh, you've seen not too far from here in the South China Sea where there's already concern of that happening now. Technology, a fourth potential game changer. In our study, we actually look at 16 different technologies, all of which offer uh, significantly increased productivity, but no one's really looked at the unintended consequences. But let me just get, look at one, the uh, 3D printing, sometimes called additive manufacturing. Uh, most people judge that this will significantly increase productivity around the world, but it will also result in, in higher unemployment. No one knows how much. But this kind of unintended consequence is something we got to explore. And the final one I would say on here is the role of the United States. We once used to consider this kind of a static, but the United States is actually changing. Um, its, its relative economic decline, we say, is probably inevitable. This doesn't mean that the U.S. economy is going to shrink. It just means that other parts of the world are growing faster. We may get more to a case of what's called primus inter pares, so U.S. first among equals, but not the dominating picture it once was. Will the U.S. be able to work with the rest of the world, and the rest of the world with the United States, to reinvent an international system that can be really applied to this changing dynamic? It's something we're not so sure of. Uh, we then take all these things together, and we, kinda, we prepare a, a few alternative scenarios uh, for the president, because we can't say we're absolutely sure which one. 
And let me just throw out three here, but there's other ones we're considering. The first one is what we would probably consider the bad scenario. This one is where the U.S. economy uh, continues to struggle, the U.S. turns inward, uh, the, the, there's a vacuum in the international system, and the world becomes make more chaotic. That would be what we consider the bad scenario. The better, the best scenario would probably be something where the U.S. does recover, it finds some way of cooperating and working with China, there's a golden age of kind of technological innovation that then spawns from that, and there's a global consensus about how to proceed in the future. Most likely it'll be something in between these two. Uh, one that we show here, which we call fragmentation, is the result of, uh, let's say, multi-speed global economy. Different areas grow faster than others. And there, but there's an absence of political will to solve global problems. Now, when we present this to the president, we'll present this and probably some other scenarios. Uh, some people ask, why don't we just tell the president it's going to be like this? Because we don't know which one. It would be nice if we could, but we don't want to fall into the trap that Dan Gardner pointed out in his book, that those people who are most sure of the future are the most often wrong. And nevertheless, it is very useful. The president finds it very, very helpful. It gives him, for example, signposts, things to look for as we go in the coming years about which path we may be going up in. And it also shows uh, perhaps uh, areas in which policy can be adapted to encourage the path down, let's say, a more favorable one than one that's less favorable. Thank you very much.